Pratiti becoming aware, uh, which we started uh, this year, in which I think uh, we have uh, these uh, lectures once in a month, uh, yes, once in a month in this series. Uh, this started after our uh, experience with uh, Isaga last year, and uh, when where we had a series of lectures by international experts uh, on uh, gaming and simulation. Uh, gaming and simulation now we are realizing is uh, having a um, big impact in many areas, especially in uh, the educational teaching. Uh, as, a, as a university, we are now experiencing the importance of this uh, area of research. And uh, through these talks by various experts, we are becoming more and more aware of uh, how these uh, techniques can be utilized in our functioning. Uh, today, we have an eminent uh, person in this field, Dr. Ramesh Sharma, Director HRD Center of Ambedkar University, Delhi, and uh, he will be uh, speaking on designing interactive game-based learning through the lens of uh, cognitive uh, cognitive load. Uh, uh, I hope this will be very useful, uh, especially for knowing the impact mm -hmm. of uh, cognitive role in the uh, learning schemes of um, educational institutions. Uh, and uh, we are sure we will be enriched by the knowledge Dr. Ramesh Sharma is going to share with us uh, and uh, introduce us to this interesting field in uh, gaming and simulation. With these words, uh, I welcome Dr. Ramesh Sharma on behalf of the university and um, over to you, Aditi. Thank you, sir, for giving a warm welcome. So before starting the session, let me give the audience a brief introduction about Dr. Ramesh Sharma. He is the director of Human Resource Development Center and a faculty for instructional design and chairperson of the committee to facilitate adoption of MOOCs for Swayam, MOOCs platform of the government of India at Dr. B. R. Ambedkar University, Delhi. Earlier, he has taught educational technology and learning resources at Vasant Open University, Malaysia. He is an expert in open and distance and technology mediated learning and has served as visiting professor at University of Fiji Commonwealth of Learning as director of Commonwealth Educational Media Center for Asia, New Delhi, regional director of Indira Gandhi National Open University, India, and director of distance education at University of Guana, South America. He has been a member of advisory group on human resource development for the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. While at the University of Guana, he also collaborated with the UNDP for its enhanced public trust, security and inclusion project, volunteer service overseas, and United Nations volunteer to develop suitable education opportunities for communities and youth. He is also the editor of Asian Journal of Distance Education, which was launched in 2003 and has been associated with several other peer-reviewed journals, including SSCI, Scopus Journals as reviewer, editor, and editorial advisory board member in the fields of open and distance learning. An author, editor of several books and research papers on educational technology, educational multimedia, and e-learning, Dr. Sharma is a practitioner promoting open educational resources. He has been a trainer and a capacity builder in the field of educational technology and has supervised doctoral research in the field. He has also conducted workshops and evaluation activities for Indira Gandhi National Open University, Commonwealth of Learning, Canada, Commonwealth Educational Media Center for Asia, New Delhi, United Nations, Conference on Trade and Commerce, Geneva, and Aga Khan Foundation, amongst others. So with this, uh, I welcome him for the webinar and I request him to start the session. Okay, thank you, Dr. Aditi, and thank you, Professor Guru Prasadji and Dr. Dubey. Uh, I'm grateful that you remembered me. It is always a pleasure. So far, I was listening 
<laughs> to the wonderful speeches by our other colleagues. And uh, today I will share some of my thoughts about how we can use certain psychological practices and principles for designing interactive game-based learning through the lens of cognitive mode. Uh, okay. Actually, this field is emerging very much. Just in the morning, uh, there was one another conference on English language teaching. And I think uh, last week, I was giving a presentation at uh, the UNESCO New Delhi office here. And I presented there on brain computer interface, which is a very exciting field in which we are trying to see that how with the help of uh, uh, certain technological tools, we can uh, you know, uh, find solutions to certain problems where some people, they have uh, neurological disorders or something. And uh, this science is, uh, this field is being researched vigorously because of its uh, uh, applications in so many areas. We are yet to understand fully that how our brain functions. Means it's, it's a completely mysterious organ in our body. And uh, means I, I was talking in the morning session that people sometimes say, oh, in my heart, I have this thing. And my heart says this thing. <laughs> but you know, if you talk to a physician doctor, they will say that <laughs> heart is simply a pump, you know keeping the flow of blood in the body in the well <laughs> order. Otherwise, it is all the mind game which plays <laughs> with us. So it is the mind. And then means it is the brain, <laughs> in fact, actually. So mind is another layer on the on the on the conceptual map of uh, brain, where we both see. But uh, actually cognition and the study of cognitive sciences, it becomes very much important for us who are in the uh, teaching learning field. And this deals with the psychological processes of learning, memory, problem solving, which have made major contributions to education and training and on the effectiveness and efficiency of learning strategies and instructional strategies. Uh, and uh, in its normal sense, cognitive science is the interdisciplinary scientific study of mind and its processes. So it examines the nature, the tasks, and the functions of cognition in a broad sense. And cognitive scientists, they study intelligence and behavior with a focus on how the nervous system, it represents processes and transforms information. Therefore, the mental faculties of concern to cognitive scientists include language, perception, memory, attention, reasoning, emotions, to understand that how these faculties uh, and these cognitive scientists, they borrow from the fields such as linguistics, psychology, artificial intelligence, philosophy, neuroscience, and anthropology, all uh, you know, a mix of those things. The typical analysis of cognitive science spans many levels of organizations, from learning to decision to logic, uh, and planning from neural circuitry to modular brain organization and those things. And one of the fundamental concepts of cognitive science is that thinking can best be understood in terms of representational structures in the mind and computational procedures that operate on these structures. So that the goal of cognitive science is to understand the principles of intelligence, with the hope that this will lead to a better comprehension of the mind and to develop intelligent devices. And although it's, it's, it's not that new, but the cognitive sciences began as an intellectual movement in the earlier 1950s, often referred to as the cognitive revolution. So the principles of cognitive science, they hold the promise of helping our learners, children, to study more effectively. 
yet they do not always make successful transitions from the lab to the applied settings and have rarely been tested in these settings. Uh, for example, self-generation of answers to questions should help children to remember. You know, it means if they have a question and they have some self-answer for that. It, you know. But what if children cannot generate anything? And what if they make an error? Do these deviations from the lab norm of perfect generation hurt? And if so, do they hurt enough that one should in practice from the uh, 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 generation? Can, we, can, we can think that can the uh, 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 feedback compensate for all these uh, uh, errors, they are uh, you know, uh, catastrophic. So now, the science of learning has made a considerable contribution to the understanding of uh, effective teaching learning strategies. And for good game-based learning experiences, uh, how to create them, we need to focus on certain specific cognitive strategies like the uh, uh, spaced practice, interleaving, retrieval practice, elaboration, concrete examples, and dual coding. These are the important uh, means, and much research has gone into them. So these, uh, uh, you know, strategies like spaced learning, where uh, you know, creating a study uh, a schedule that spreads uh, study activities over a certain period of time, and then how these can be applied in a, a given condition from there. So interleaving, retrieval practice, elaboration, concrete examples, and dual codings. There are certain strategies which play a very important part in designing game-based learning experiences. So like in dual coding, we combine the words with visuals. And those are the hints and the uh, certain factors which we uh, provide to uh, our uh, students. So let us see them, uh, uh, some of them, one by one. The benefit of spaced learning or distributed learning practice, they are arguably one of the strongest contributions to cognitive psychology, which has been made in the field of education. And the effect is simple. The same amount of repeated studying of the same information spaced over time will lead to greater retention of that information in the longer run compared with the repeated studying of the same information for the same amount of time in the one study session. The benefit of this distributed or spaced uh, uh, practice they were first empirically demonstrated in the 19th century uh, as a part of his uh, investigation. Eben Haas, uh, I mean, somewhere in 1885, found that when he spaced out repetitions across three days, he could almost have the number of repetitions necessary to relearn a series of 12 syllables in one day. And uh, he, he thus concluded that a suitable distribution means uh, uh, repetitions over a space of time is decidedly more advantageous than missing of them at a single time. So here with this graphic, uh, I think that is made clear that uh, uh, the must practice is that we have a large chunk of free time and then a large chunk of fully engaged time. Instead of that, if we have some learning session and some free time, then learning session and, and so on. And then the superior spaced uh, practice accordingly, how we can distribute that over a, uh, a certain uh, period from there. So he is uh, uh, Herman Ebbinghaus, who uh, you know, uh, examined this concept from there. And then uh, 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 we see the its, it's uh, implication in a uh, institutional curriculum setup uh, the, uh, where the teachers can introduce spacing to their students in broadly say two ways one involves creating opportunities to revisit information throughout the semester or even in future semesters and this involves 
some upfront planning and can be difficult to achieve given time constraints and the need to cover our set curriculum. Means as the uh, the uh, you know that uh, semester timing and sometimes we have many many holidays like in our university here. Uh, uh, when the semester was started, the government asked that okay now we can go February this year that the offline classes can be started in person. So the uh, immediately the uh, uh, course curriculum was uh, started transacting. But during I think it was in the month of June or May somewhere that uh, the time for uh, summer vacation came up, you know, so the things become they were uh, too much tight for that. So we, we uh, means everybody knows it about the pressure to complete the curriculum well within a reasonable time. And uh, the spacing can be achieved with no greater cost if the teachers, they set aside a few minutes per class to review the information from the previous lesson. And the second method involves putting the onus to space on the students themselves. Means, of course, this would work best with older students or the mature students uh, uh, there because spacing requires advanced planning. And it is crucial that the teachers, they help their students plan their studying. For example, teacher could suggest that students uh, schedule study sessions on days that uh, alternate with the days on which a particular class meets. Uh, for example, schedule review sessions for Tuesdays and Thursdays when the class meets on Mondays and Wednesdays uh, for a more complete uh, weekly spaced practice schedule. And it is important here to note that uh, the spacing effect refers to information that is repeated multiple times rather than the idea of studying different materials in one long session versus spaced out in small study sessions over time. But however, we need to be careful for teachers and particularly for students planning a study schedule, the subtle difference between two situations, that is spacing out restudy opportunities versus spacing out of studying of different information over time, they may be lost. That can, we need to be you know, particular about that. Another strategy is interleaving. Can uh, answer. So this is another scheduling technique that has been shown to increase learning through interleaving. And interleaving occurs when different ideas or problem types, they are tackled in a sequence as opposed to the more common method of attacking multiple versions of the same problem in a given study session. And that is known as blocking. We, we make a block of having something in one session and then you do it and then take another thing go through it completely and then uh, you know go with the next one interleaving as a principle can be applied in many different ways one such way involves interleaving different types of problems during learning which is particularly applicable to subjects such as mathematics and uh, physics uh, for example the study of uh, you know fractions or something and then uh, there have been certain uh, researches where the people they have found that uh, shuffling mathematical uh, medical problems that involves calculating the volume of different shapes results in better test performance means one week later than when students answered multiple problems of the same type uh, of shape in a row. And uh, this pattern of results has been replicated with younger uh, students. Uh, you know, so say for example, uh, the uh, you know school uh, students to learn how to solve graph and slope problems. So the proposed explanation for uh, the benefit of interleaving is that switching between different problem types allows students to acquire the ability to choose the right method for solving problem, uh, uh, different type of problem, rather than learning only the method itself and not when to apply it, that is the, uh, you know, uh, a, a important factor here. Then there we have this retrieval practice. While tests are more often used in educational settings for assessment, a lesser known benefit of tests is that they actually improve memory of the tested information. And if we think of our memories as uh, libraries of information, then it may seem surprising that retrieval means it happens uh, when we take a test improves memory 
However, we know from a lot of research that retrieving knowledge actually strengthens it. How does retrieval process help memory? You know, if you bring information to mind without actually producing it, we call it as covert retrieval. We remember the information just as well as if we overtly produce retrieved information and that is called as overt retrieval. So there are these two things, covert retrieval and overt retrieval in which uh, we, uh, you know, we learn something without producing it. And the second is case that in which we produce the retrieved information from them. So if a student reads a sentence and then immediately covers the sentence and recites it aloud, now they are likely not retrieving the information, but rather just keeping the information in their working memory long enough to recite it again. And thus it is important to balance the success of retrieval uh, for, I means without overall difficulty in retrieving the information. And if the initial retrieval process is slow, then the feedback can help improve the overall benefit of practicing retrieval. And in addition to the fact that bringing information uh, to mind directly improves memory for that information, Engaging in retrieval process can produce indirect benefit as well. For example, practicing retrieval is a powerful way to improve meaningful learning of information. And it is relatively easy to implement in the classroom. For example, we can ask our students to practice retrieval. Uh, means as simple as uh, uh, asking the students to put their class materials away and try to write out everything they know about a topic. So that way, so in that case, that memory often. And retrieval-based learning strategies are quite flexible. Since the teachers, uh, we can give our students practice tests, for example, short answer or multiple choice. We can provide open-ended prompts to recall information or ask them to create concept maps from memory. Uh, like if they, if we are teaching them about, uh, say, animal kingdom or parts of a plant, then we can tell them that, okay, from whatever you have seen in your daily life, if you can create a concept map uh, from there, that will make them, uh, you know, to understand it in a better way. Another strategy here would be for elaboration which involves connecting new information to the pre-existing knowledge that connect is there. And one possible instantiation of the elaboration is thinking about information on a deeper level. And as we know, information will be remembered better if it is processed more deeply in terms of meaning rather than shallowly in terms of a form. But one major problem with this framework is that it is difficult to measure the depth of means understanding or knowledge from them. And if we are not able to actually measure the depth, then the argument can become circular. Means you can just keep on going and going and no uh, positive outcome is coming from there. Means is it that something was remembered better because it was studied more deeply? Or do we conclude that it must have been studied more deeply because it is remembered better. And elaboration is such a broad term and it can include so many different techniques that it is difficult to claim that elaboration is always help in learning. And there are a certain techniques under the umbrella of elaboration for which there is relatively uh, strong evidence in terms of the effectiveness. And that is called as elaborative interrogation. And this involves the students questioning the material that they are studying. Hence, more specifically, students using this technique could ask how and why questions about the concepts they are studying. You know, uh, you just uh, uh, see here an example on the physics of uh, uh, flight. Uh, why there is downwash behind the wings? Uh, how does upward force, you know, the lift work? Why does a plane need an engine? 
how does a plane take off and those kind of things so and then crucially the students would try to answer these questions either from their materials or eventually from their memory there we can provide concrete examples providing sporting information it can improve the learning of key ideas and concepts specifically using these kind of examples to supplement the content that is more conceptual in nature and this will lead to making the idea easier to understand and remember no the concrete when we provide concrete example there are several advantages to the learning process like they can concisely convey the information uh, they can provide the students with more in concrete information that is easier to remember and they can take advantage of the superior memorability of the pictures relative to the words and one concern with using concrete example is that students might only remember the examples especially if they are particularly memorable such as fun or some gimmicky example and they won't be able to transfer their understanding from one example to another or more broadly to the abstract concept in fact this is quite funny uh, when i was a uh, means i think it was in my when i was a student in fourth or fifth class uh, our teacher taught us about the solar system so here is the sun and then we have a uh, uh, you know uh, mercury venus earth mars jupiter etc etc all those and after that uh, she showed us the a model of uh, solar system uh, made of uh, wood means wooden solar system in which there were springs and there were circular motions and you rotate them so you can uh, show that how moon revolves around the earth and those kind of things now what happened this is quite funny i had a good understanding of solar system i knew actual how in this space in the universe the solar system would look like our teacher gave us examination after that class and i in my own thought i thought that let me draw this model and it will impress the teacher so i, I explained the solar system but the diagram which i draw was the of the model and i got zero marks so <laughs> and everybody laughed in my class you know they said that what did you do and i said that it is correct you, you are just to explain solar system i explained this solar system but the diagram is <laughs> not that appropriate in that context i still remember that when i was thinking i am going to impress everybody but i got a in a way i got i got a kick <laughs> so that, that 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 those things they they have happened and this is interesting uh, dual coding you know you may recall that famous statement when many people they say means i don't know who said it but we repeat it uh, many times that a picture is worth a thousand words means what i can explain in long essay if i can show the photograph of a picture that is more impactful it, it is famously you know quoted and indeed it is well understood that more information can be conveyed through a simple illustration then through several paragraphs of text and they can be particularly helpful when the described concept involves several parts or steps and is intended for individuals with low prior knowledge so for example here uh, it uh, uh, an illustration on how information can flow through neurons and uh, you know uh, uh, synapses or those things how can we humanize the technology while fostering innovations and those things so you have the guiding questions you have the accessibility into spatial computing ethics uh, 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 innovators those uh, things by having a look at this you can say that uh, how means uh, the immersive which is a combination of human and immersive learning it can be taken further Uh, from there and in addition to being able to convey information more succinctly the pictures are also more memorable than words in the memory literature this is referred to as the picture superiority effect we call it picture superiority effect 
and a dual coding theory was developed in part to explain this effect. So dual coding follows from the notion of text being accompanied by the complementary visual information to enhance learning. So you can see here, if we are going with verbal, so we are explaining uh, uh, that way and adding that visual to it. So, and then the it's haptic implications for that there. So this leads, these parameters take us to the cognitive load theory which describes the learning structures in terms of an information processing system, which involves long-term memory and thereby associating indirectly with working memory. And to understand this, first we have to know that what a working memory is. And working memory performs the intellectual tasks associated with consciousness. However, it is you know, limited in both capacity and duration. So the uniqueness of working memory is that information may only be stored in the long-term memory after first being attempted to and processed uh, by working memory. So long-term memory effectively stores all of our knowledge and skills on a permanent basis. And the limitations of working memory under some conditions impede learning. So cognitive load theory comes into the field of education means, uh, somewhere early uh, 80s. The basic principle here is that the quality of instructional design or the learning experiences is directly proportional to the consideration given to the role and uh, limitations of the working memory. And hence the cognitive load theory has been used to develop various instructional strategies uh, which have been demonstrated empirically to be superior to those used conventionally. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dupe, just give me five seconds. Uh, I will post a message in my group. Thank you so much. So then let us understand what is cognitive development. Now it is the development of mental processes like thinking, learning, remembering, problem solving, etc. And these are different from other psychological constructs, which are like emotions, friendship, or personality traits. These cognitive processes, they change with age or experience. And you would agree to the fact that no one single instructional technique can work well for all the students at all grade levels. And certain instructional techniques are more beneficial to some students than others. And uh, 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 means uh, uh, we need to be careful that we must not teach a topic to undergraduate students in the same way we would teach it to the postgraduate students. Therefore, it is pertinent here that the instruction has to be designed based on the needs of different groups of students. And as appropriate instructional design helps a teacher to become more flexible and enable the teacher to help in the problem solving. And this leads us to understand that in that case then, what is instructional psychology? To understand it, we need to understand the learning theories. And the learning theories, they have evolved from, say, from the initial period, from behaviorism, where objectives and reinforcement techniques are used to focus on the learning effort, to cognitivism, where information processes occurs within brain based uh, on inputs, and to constructivism, where the learner creates their own meaning. So this meaning further depends on learner's interaction with people's presence at a place, adoption of a thing in terms of a social context. And these theories, they have significant value in the learning psychology. And that's why when we are working on creating some game-based learning experiences, these things, they help us very much. And this, 
further the instructional psychology it is usually referred to as the theory and principles derived from the applications of psychological principles for the improvement of instruction or that result when psychologists they conduct research on various forms of uh, instruction so then how it is applicable uh, uh, when we are creating these game based learning experiences designs so we need to follow a systematic process of translating general principles of learning and instruction into plans for instructional materials and learning therefore important concepts of learning design include here instructional materials learning activities and assessment of instruction and learning and the global trends uh, they show that uh, say like uh, distance education or training it is being increasingly used in campus mode learning settings and if we speak of distance education the nature of distance learners gender culture self concept etc we need to take into consideration while thinking of game based learning designs there is a need to know the learner offer them orientation design for differences in learning styles and since these learners they are adult learners therefore the distance educators need to look more closely at their use of behavioral and cognitive approaches to the learning design and uh, some scholars they believe that behaviorism plays a significant role in the instructional design while others consider a constructivist per perspective as a base for learning strategy uh so there are various uh, you know uh, changes in approaches to learning theories towards the uh, practice of uh, designing game based learning experiences and although it may seem that the cognitive theory is the dominant theory in the uh, instructional design uh, the instructional strategies adopted by behaviorists they are also used by cognitivists so behaviorists they prefer learners to decide a starting point for instruction whereas the cognitivists they expect the learner to decide their predisposition to learning so that way there is a little bit challenge uh, to that and then the uh, cognitive teaching model so the cognitive approach is the basic approach to learning process by studying the structure of thinking and remembering the cognitive approach to game based learning it tries to understand an individual's thought process and briscoll uh, a very famous personality uh, described that the cognitive approach refers to all the processes by which the sensory input is transformed reduced elaborated stored recovered and used and this includes hypothetical stages or aspects such as uh, uh, sensations in the games perceptions imagery retention recall problem solving and thinking skills when adopt when uh, you know undergoing those uh, game based learning experiences so the basic uh, uh, cognitive information processing model is uh, concerned with mental operations it is related to how an individual perceives and remembers events and information as to how it was explained initially to the learner therefore we means we need to remember that learning is a process that is dictated by the students previous experiences and how the information is presented to the students therefore there are certain implications for designing game based uh, uh, learning uh, uh, means uh, in the light of cognitive teaching model like the information uh, a students information knowledge uh, is informal knowledge is the base for that and this is because new material the which comes to the students it is learned with ease when it is related to what is known to them initially the students current mindset should be identified the errors committed by the students and the misconceptions prevailing in the students mind they should be viewed as a source of information to know about their mental makeup and uh, since think aloud activities they help to uncover current models they should be used 
hands on experiences should be used uh, besides explicitly teaching problem solving strategies and this is because when students learn from uh, observation certain minute details may be missed but they remember it better when they do a task or activity themselves and then the processes the structure the decisions they develop conceptual understanding and this is a focus area in designing game based uh, learning from there so what can be the prerequisite for uh, adopting cognitive strategies for game based uh, learning design means it has its implications for effective in development of mental abilities which can be thinking remembering deducing of the students suppose a learner wishes to remember a list of items we have given them a task an effective cognitive strategy that this learner can adopt is to create different mental images for each item and link them i still remember long back uh, maybe some 20 or 30 years ago when it was dur darshan there were not so many these channels which are available now a program came in which there was this expert and he was shown 50 of different objects all kind including non human and human objects means something and uh, uh, they were they were passed in front of him 50 in number and after that he could tell that what was at position number 1 2 3 and at random also that when he was asked that what was at 35th position he could tell and that was quite a, you know a unique thing a, a, a special skill so those things how we can create a different mental image for each item and then link and to accomplish this the learners they need to have a prerequisite of the ability to have visual images let us consider another example suppose a learner wants to solve a complex mathematical problem they can break this problem into parts and try solving individual parts first and then combining them this strategy involves pre requisite of the ability uh, uh, to divide a verbally described situation into parts an important factor here is the level of the innate ability of the learner which is developed through maturation and how much they have learned and you may be knowing two famous psychologists piaget he gave more significance to maturation whereas techne considered cognitive strategies as generalizations from the learned intellectual skills from there so during our lifetime we keep learning and this learning includes learning of motor skills like uh, eating with a fork or tying our shoelaces or writing letters of alphabet in the childhood something acquire information like adding new words to our vocabulary making patterns relationship among different pieces of knowledge from there and besides learning in I mean, our mother tongue it creates less pressure than studying in a foreign language this is because while studying in a foreign language the brain must work to translate the language besides trying to grasp the new information and cognition also facilitates in understanding how the prior to occurrence of information loss the individual units of information they can be retained in the short term memory therefore uh, the these game based learning designs they must be applied in such a way that the students retain the information which has been presented to them in the classroom permanent in their memory and this can be achieved by maximizing the opportunities the students have to practice their recently learned content and encouraging elaborate encoding of the information for example by pondering over why how when uh, etc of the content and it has been found that memory can be improved uh, when such uh, environments are created which leads to higher emotional response on the part of the learners so just a minute my next Oh. Yes. So then we come to cognitive load theory, and it states that the learning will be maximized by ensuring the learner's working memory 
to free to attend solely to encoding to be learned information. And this cognitive load theory is based on certain tenets of cognitive learning, like the short-term memory, which is called as working memory, is limited in capacity to about seven information units. The long-term memory is unlimited in capacity and is where all the information and the knowledge is stored. And the knowledge is stored in the long-term memory as a schema or schemata. And this schema, no matter how large or how complex, they are treated as a single entity in the working memory. And the good thing is that schemas can be automated. The cognitive load theory uh, uh, differentiates between three types of cognitive load, and which can be intrinsic cognitive load, that is the load on the memory needed at the time of doing the current task, that is the intrinsic load on. And then the extraneous load, like the teacher's presentations, external distractions, the, the textbook format or something. And then the germane cognitive load. This is to learn the certain something new and uh, which is going into the next higher level of scheme. And a combination of these things is calculated as total cognitive load from there. So what are the implications of these game-based learning? There are means uh, it, it, a certain, the, we believe that learning can be enhanced by redesigning the, uh, the, the instructional materials to reduce the level of extraneous cognitive load. So we need to you know, uh, uh, lower that. So controlling the elements of to be learned information and their interactivity with one another would exhibit better results. So we need to control that. Then the game designers, they can control the conditions of learning within an environment or more generally within most the instructional materials. So that is the germane or the schema related cognitive load where we need to pay to that, that these instructional designers, they can decrease the extraneous cognitive load and increase the germane load to learn the new information from there. And uh, uh, then this, uh, uh, the uh, uh, need to minimize the to cognitive, total cognitive load and maximize the cognitive resources which are available to be utilized in the learning process. In other words, if uh, for some reason, cognitive load increases rather than decreasing, then the learning will be inhibited. And then uh, the development of strategy and techniques that result in both reduced training time and enhanced performance. And this is very important uh, uh, facet of uh, education and training industries. And the cognitive load uh, means uh, has applicability on the subjects that focus on problem solving skills like uh, mathematics, physics, chemistry, computer science, and then they are inbuilt as the instructional process of uh, these uh, you know, uh, subjects. I want to share this uh, 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 interesting write-up uh, by uh, uh, Melanie Knight. Uh, who is an instructional designer and she did a summary of the a chapter uh, of uh, design for how people learn which was written by julie dirksen and it it provides the anatomy of a habit means what are our habits to analyze that and means first of all let us say that what a habit is and a habit can be defined as an acquired behavior pattern which is regularly followed until it has become almost involuntary. And Julie describes the need for acquisition, that is learning the behavior, a trigger to activate that behavior, a feedback, a practice, a repetition, and a supportive environment. That is the, uh, a, 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 you know, the, uh, the things really. And then she proposes this fog behavior model, which shows that 
how the occurrence of a behavior relies on motivation, ability, and the trigger. And these things, they are an inherent component of any game. You know, we have certain motivations, we have certain abilities, and then there are certain triggers or prompts when we play a certain game. Uh, then uh, another uh, uh, model is the ability and means motivation, ability, and uh, uh, opportunity, which are essential for behavior change. And to make these changes, uh, uh, there are certain factors like uh, knowledge. We need to make our students aware, help them understand from uh, form mental models, then attitude and emotions, means make the students care, connect to emotions, values, and then motivations, means the motivational need, create need satisfying experiences like, and then fears, uh, means acknowledge and diffuse those fears, social norms, using social norms, how we can take. And then there are certain abilities we need to identify. Goal setting abilities, mindfulness uh, are there to cultivate the will development of willpower, strengthening self-efficacy, means providing fast experiences of success, diffuse the guilt, diffuse the frustration from there. Uh, creating ability, means building new knowledge, skills, improving the reusability or ensuring what are the necessary resources for that. And uh, social support, providing that. And the habits, repeating, ultimately it becomes automatic, like learning a cycle. Once we do that, but after a certain stage, it, be, we, it, it becomes automatic. Means we, you can uh, uh, you know, uh, ride a bicycle with your hands folded like that, just only pedaling closing your eyes, you can still do that. So those things. Then there are certain opportunities to be provided, opportunities like time, space, and cues. Find rhythm, make future means allow them to complete them in parts, time. Spacing, allow spaces for action. Provide cue. Cue can be wanted cues, which are needed, and unwanted cues, which need to be removed from those gaming experiences there. And then we design for habit. And uh, there are certain, like, uh, if this happens, then I will. That is there. So to create the, a certain kind of it, this means that decision is made ahead of time and fewer cognitive processes are needed. So these things, they, they uh, are uh, uh, there. And then uh, uh, here, uh, another thing that, how to shrink the habit by identifying the smallest productive behavior. And once that habit is established, we can have more behaviors added to the learning scenario. And it is useful to spread out the introduction of habit to give Hello? time. Sorry for the interruption. We are running behind the time. So can we take question answers from the panelists and the audience? This is the last one. Okay. So this new behavior, it should be made as uh, yeah, I mean, easy as possible. We can change them into the existing habit or remove the triggers for the undesirable habits. So ultimately the students, they can be given opportunity to think for themselves, how they can reduce their barriers and how the existing behaviors can be linked to the change. So thank you so much. So if any participants or panelists have any questions, they can also post in the chat box. Any questions? Yeah, I had a question for Dr. Sharma. Uh, so uh, this, uh, uh, when you talk about this uh, cognitive uh, uh, role of the cognitive science, yeah. uh, then uh, that in the in the science uh, education, you know, uh, we do a lot of uh, experimental in experimental science. Yes. So 
that that's uh, how, how much does that uh, help in understanding because we feel that that makes them understand much better than uh, theory yeah uh, actually here the applications of those uh, uh, the three type of loads which comes into play that what is the intrinsic load and uh, so the understanding by showing them visuals or by allowing them to carry out certain experiments themselves or we give them certain demonstrations and then there is a factor of uh, uh, you know germane load by showing them certain say like uh, if i say if we want to show them uh, rimer timon reaction or something or something of nmr spectroscopy or uh, balancing the load in physics or optometry those in physics which come into various thing so we need to make a balance of increasing the germen load which is related to learning of the new experiences removing the extraneous load extraneous load is that suppose if we are take we have taken the students to the chemistry lab and we want them to focus on certain uh, uh, one experiment but then there are other things in the lab like some machine is uh, putting in some corner and they become curious oh what is that so you know it means that then their attention is being diverted and this factor plays a important role into the gaming uh, as well when we are designing a game what kind of you know uh, the 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 uh, environmental uh, objects are there in that will it divert the attention of the learner or how it will add so it's all of uh, you know balancing these cognitive loads in a particular way that what will enhance their memory and what may bar or put some restriction on them it is a great application for yeah in, in designing that then you uh, try to minimize the diversion in this or yes the, the diversion should be you know minimized this this is what you uh, aim to do is it in the design yes Uh, i had one related question uh, you have seen that you know in the uh, new uh, kind of uh, education policies and new schemes which we are we are going having yes uh, there is more emphasis on uh, uh, diversion mm -hmm. because uh, the student is given more options to choose from uh, other than the subject he is interested in he is also supposed to choose from other subjects other areas other domains yes yes which, yeah, the provision was not there before yeah, yeah. Uh, how much it's going to help so. uh, actually uh, we are yet to see because uh, although uh, you know in distance education like in indira gandhi national open university we had that flexibility that we had a bouquet of courses so you select one course from group a one course from group b and something and the national education policy is like uh, uh, allowing the students that in addition to physics you can yes. take fashion designing and some yeah, yeah. but here the inherent understanding of the student will come into play out of just curiosity or having seen that oh okay this looks better new creative something they may go into it but unless their abilities they support the learning of that because every discipline has their own uh, foundations yeah the understanding of that is essential so if they have studied something as their foundational up to their matriculation or their 10th class then that will make the base of that because they have to start from there so so means if it is other means if it will not be at all impossible it may create certain challenges in difficulty so that may lead either into a longer time duration in completing to that or maybe after second year in the third year or somewhere the student may request that oh okay i want to go back to that discipline and something something from there yeah this is at the initial stages i mean we need to see how the students take it because yeah, it has yeah, just yeah. been introduced right yeah. now uh, and oh. a, a related uh, a psychological or a learning theory concept is related to it that there are two terms we call them as convergent thinking and divergent thinking you know so that will also play a important role here that 
how the student is able to think of certain question and when we say divergent then a problem has how many different solutions that goes with that and convergent thinking means taking some example from physics and literature and computer sciences and then poetry and something and combining them to converge on something those things those abilities i think they are and perhaps we believe that when we talk of uh, 21st century skills and most common of them are communication collaboration creativity uh, and those things we need to take care of them i uh, means all uh, means prepare our students for that otherwise uh, i don't know maybe after three or four years another commission may be constituted to review these situations and then take appropriate because like what happened with the uh, 1986 policy after that in 1992 we had a plan of uh, program of action and yeah. stating that how the things should go so but means we are still in the uh, that uh, uh, you know uh, transition phase with this yeah yeah that's okay. Yeah. okay thank you thank you namaste thank you thank you sir so as we come to the end of the webinar i now request dr jigyasu dubey coordinator center of excellence in simulation and gaming s triple b to propose words of thanks thank you aditi i on behalf of the center of excellence in simulation and gaming and shri vaishnav vidyapeeth vishwavidyalaya indore would like to give our most sincere thanks to dr ramesh sharma for accepting our invitation and giving precious time out of his busy schedule and uh, A special thanks to Dr. Upinder Dhar, Honorable Vice Chancellor of SSPLV, and uh, Dr. Santosh Dhar, Dean FDSR for mentoring COESG. Uh, we are also thankful to Dr. Ken Guru Prasad, Dean Faculty of Science at SSPLV, for being with us today. Our special thanks to our panelists, Dr. Yusuf Vedoida, Dr. Mantosh Holdar Ji, Dr. Uttam Sharma Ji, Dr. Rajavad Ji, and all other panelists present and the participants who make this webinar successful. thanks to dr aditi veda and all the members of coesg of the university at the end uh, we also extend our thanks to the it team of the university for their excellent support and thank you again thank you to all of you thank you very much thank you sir we request all the participants to please fill the feedback mentioned in the chat box to get the e certificates we'll soon meet with the next webinar thank you once again for joining okay nice. thank you ramesh thank you thank you, thank you dr shamas thank you gurupasad ji thank, thank you very you, much sir. thank you sir